Last time we were chatting about the Sermon on the Mount, we were looking at the way that Jesus fulfills the law. The way that the law is not the bare minimum that we try to just do at least that much, but it is something that points in a, in a direction. So the law, for example, exhorts us not to lie. And it's not just don't lie. It's not even don't have to be, don't swear oaths. It's become so trustworthy that you don't need to swear oaths. That no one even doubts that you would ever lie. That if I say I'm good for it, that's it. You trust the person who gives their word, right? In the same way the law tells us not to murder. And Jesus looks at this and says, it's not just don't murder, it's don't even disparage someone. Don't even look down on someone. Don't even look, think less of someone. For thinking less of someone is the first step on treat, towards treating them as less than yourself. See how this, this works? Right? The law, it, uh, it points in a direction. And when we follow through the law, it, it points us in a way to which we go. And Jesus fulfills the law then. The way he fulfills the law is in the same way um, that, for example, a, a fruit flower is for, fulfilled by becoming a piece of fruit. There, there's a transformation that happens there, that, that you go from fruit to fruit flower to, to fruit, and that, that's the way it was supposed to happen, that transformation. We read today, uh, Jesus is laying this out again. He's taking this, this very big topic. How do we handle violence? How do we handle retaliation? And he says to the people, You have heard what it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go a second. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes sun rise both on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. All right. Jesus is, what Jesus is doing here is he's laying out the last, last step in this arc of, of sort of growing up and maturing that the Bible lays out. If you go back to the very beginning of the Bible, you see a sort of a people, what comes most naturally. You see uh, it's in Genesis 4, this, this guy named Lamech. And Lamech t t looks at his wives, Ada and Zila, and says to them, Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me. A young man I have killed for striking me. If my father Cain was avenged sevenfold, I am avenged seventy-sevenfold. What you might call that is unlimited retaliation, right? If you hurt me, I'll kill you. And if you kill someone in my family, I will wipe out everyone in yours. So that's unlimited retaliation. And there's a certain logic to this. Don't mess with me, because you're going to pay for it if you do. Right? That's the logic of it. And it works really well as long as you're the biggest, baddest, toughest person around. Uh, but I don't know if that's exactly what God had desired for us, is to live uh, a life of intimidation and fear. And so if that's how we start out, that's the most immature thing, that's how we all kind of start out, uh, might makes right, you might say. Uh, what God does, as soon as God has gathered the people and starts sending them towards the promised land, the first half of Exodus is getting them out of Egypt, the second half of Exodus is sending them to the promised land and teaching them along the way. And so what we find in Exodus 21 is th th what we just read. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot, burn for a burn, wound for a wound, stripe for a stripe. You ever leave a small child alone for a few minutes and you can't just say don't get into trouble. You have to say now don't get in the pantry, don't get in the fridge, don't go downstairs, don't mess with the knives, don't touch the... It, that's what this sounds like, right? Now eye for an eye, tooth for you're going through the list making sure it's just totally clear that you are not to get you don't have to hurt someone more than they hurt you. And, and what, what this is getting at, this eye for an eye, it's not saying that, uh, oh, let's say that, that someone hurts you. It's not saying make sure to get back at them at least as much as they hurt you. It's saying don't get back at them more than they hurt you. If, if someone punches you, 
don't kill their dog. I mean, if someone like talks smack about you, don't don't sue them. I mean, that, that's kind of the point here. It, it, it's limited retaliation. So we go from unlimited retaliation to here in Exodus, this would be limited retaliation. And though, and it still is around, right? We don't say eye for an eye anymore. What do we say instead? We say the punishment should fit the crime. Right? Our law and justice system today is still pretty much th this right here. Limited retaliation. How much was the person hurt? That's how much the person who, who, who hurt them should pay. Eye for an eye or the punishment fits the crime. Well, that's early on in the people of God. Jesus, uh, God is training them, and, and then they take the next step growing up, the next step to maturity. We go from unlimited retaliation to limited retaliation, and, and we get, it's in Leviticus, we get to uh, what you might call limited love. This is where it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your own people. You shall love your neighbor. Right? Love your neighbor. It, we, we, Love your own, right? Love your own, take care of your family. Every th everyone outside your group, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but those inside your group, uh, you should take care of, right? You don't look at your kid and say, we're going to do eye for an eye here, son, and you know, that's not how, how we do things. Right? You don't look at your family member, your neighbors, the people in your church, and, and do eye for an eye. You, you don't hold a grudge against them. You, you start to learn how to love them. And we see this again, it's in the laws of, of, of uh, early Israel. We see things like you could sell yourself into slavery if you were in debt and every 50 years all the property in Israel hit reset in the year of Jubilee and so if you sold yourself into, into slavery to get out of debt you were never going to be in slavery for more than 49 years at most whenever that year of Jubilee was coming maybe it's 5 years off, maybe it's 10 years off that, it was done so that uh, it was a way of loving your neighbor that your, your neighbor would never be so down and out that they couldn't get free eventually and especially their kids but that only applied if you were a Jew. If you weren't a Jewish person, hey, you sell yourself into slavery, permanent slavery, right? So that, that, was, that was the next step. We've got, you go from unlimited retaliation, you hurt me, I'll kill your family, to limited retaliation, you hurt me, I'll hurt you no more than you hurt me, to limited love, love your neighbor and everyone else, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And that's where we stand at the end of the Old Testament when, when Jesus shows up and says, there's a next step, there's, there's a better way. And that better way that Jesus talks about is laid out here. It's laid out here where Jesus says, love everyone. You are made in the image of God, and you know we are meant to love like God loves. And what I, when I think of this, I start thinking of the way in which... Uh, remember the first time you opened your mouth and your mom came out? The first time you opened your mouth and there was your dad? Who looked in the mirror? Whew, isn't that an odd moment? Uh, it's the same thing. If we are children of a Heavenly Father, we are meant to grow up and mature so that when we open our mouths, grace, the grace of our Father comes out, the love of our Father comes out, the patience of our Heavenly Father comes out. That's what we're growing towards. That's what we're striving towards. The same God who sends sunshine on all the fields and rain to all of those who have done good and all those who have not, right? That's how we are called to love, love all people. For if we hurt another person who has hurt us, then you can't hate another person and follow the God who is love. When we hate someone, we are denying that we are children of the God who is love, right? Now, this, this call to love other people, this call to love all other people, I, the examples Jesus gives are important to pay attention to. For example, Jesus says, go the second mile, right? Who would force you to march a mile in the first century? What, what was happening was uh, Israel is... From my point of view, well, let's see, Mediterranean, and then there's Rome, and it goes around and around to Egypt, and Israel's over here on the, the eastern edge of the Mediterranean. That's where a lot of Roman legions came through. If you wanted to get from the north part of the Roman Empire to the south, you either had to go across the Mediterranean by boats, on boats, and the Romans did not like boats. Uh, so they, they marched everywhere. They'd march around, and they'd have to go through Israel. And... Uh, so as these Roman legionaries, soldiers, would march through with their heavy 70-pound bags, soldiers have been carrying 70-pound bags for centuries, um, they could snag anyone and say, hey you, 
you're going to carry my bag for a mile here. But they couldn't do it for more than a mile. Or then they got in trouble with their sergeant. And so if someone, what Jesus is saying, if someone snags you and says, is going to force, do you wrong, force you to carry this bag, you, walk, you march the mile and then you keep on going. How does that change the situation? Imagine what this looks like. The column is marching down the road, the Roman roads, and you got snagged to march that mile. You just keep on marching along, and what's that soldier going to do? Is he going to, what, take a swing at you and try to take the bag back? No. He, if he draws any attention to himself, his sergeant's going to come down on him something fierce. The Romans were not known for their forgiveness and patience. No, I mean, it's kind of an aggressive, it's an interestingly aggressive thing. You try to do me wrong, I'm not going to hurt you back, but I'm going to put you in a fun little spot here, and you just keep on marching, and the, now you have gained control of the situation, haven't you? Because now you're carrying his bag. you got his stuff. The same type of thing. If uh, you are sued and someone's going after you, and they want to take your, your shirt, your coat, fine. Pile it up, put it with your cloak, and just hand it over with a smile. It was against Jewish law to take a person's cloak overnight. You could not take a person's cloak overnight because that's what you slept in, right? That's your blanket. That's what, And so if you're going to be so vicious and mean as to go, go at me and sue me, fine, here's my coat and I'll give you my cloak too. And I'll just wait for you because you're going to have to come back and find me about sundown and give that cloak back because it would be a source of shame if you were to hold my cloak overnight. It's, it's, it's amazing that twist there, right? The, the turn the other cheek really is the best, and it's the most visual. Anyone here feeling a little... Come on up. Come on up. I haven't seen you for a while. Hey, the peaches are here. You're about the same height as me, so that's why I'm picking on you. If you wanted to insult me right now, the most, one of the most insulting things you could do would be to slap me across the... Right? Yeah. So, so if you did this... Yeah. Now, I turned the other cheek. You can't do that again. Well, you have to close your fist, right? Yeah. You slap an inferior. You punch an equal. Yeah. And so if you turn the other cheek, you see how that works? If you turn the other cheek, I have said, if you slap me, now I turn the other cheek, you can't slap me again. You can't demean me. You can, take a, you can punch me, but you punch an equal. Yeah. Thank you. All right? That changed my understanding of this entire passage. Someone pointed that out to me. It, it, it's sort of the, it's this very assertive way of standing up for yourself. I'm not going to hurt you back. I'm going to love you, but you're not going to roll over me. Right? This is Martin Luther King Jr. standing on the bridge at Salma. I'm marching across this bridge. You can let the dogs go. That's okay. Here we go. Right? I, I, I really, it, it's a very subversive way to do this. To love your enemies. It means you don't hurt them back. It doesn't mean that you just roll over and take it and just, eh, whatever, limp noodle. I'm a Christian. I'll just take whatever is dished out. We love our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. And this understanding of love does not condone what is wrong. I can love someone who's hurt me. I can pray for them. It doesn't mean I, th I, I agree that it was the right thing for them to do. It just means I'm not going to hurt them in return. I'm going to pray for the best for them. God will still send the rain and the sun upon that person tomorrow. And I am called, as every follower of Jesus is called, to love them in the same way. Now, I've got to be honest that if you number these stages from unlimited retaliation 1, limited retaliation 2, limited love 3, and unlimited love 4, if, if you hurt me, if you ask me about it in about the first two or three minutes after you've taken a swing at me, I don't think I can get to four. If I can do two and a half, I'm doing pretty good. Right? You don't usually want my first response when, when I've been hurt. And I think that's true for most of us, right? If someone takes a swing at you, we can all be gracious, but it usually takes, what, five, ten minutes for us to be able to... Okay, I'm going to love that. Okay, I'm going to love them. Yeah, I just got to... Second responses, right? That's, but that's part of growing up, right? It takes time. It takes time to mature. It takes time to get that second response, that graceful response, a little bit quicker. And the shame about growing up and maturing... As Jesus is talking about here, growing and, uh, into the image of our Heavenly Father, is that it only ever happens under pressure. Have you ever noticed that? It's, everyone's graceful when everything's going well. 
It's when things don't go well. What's that old uh, uh, commercial? When your true colors come shining through? That's when you find out if you're really forgiving, if you really are loving. It's not when everything's going well. It's when things start to go badly. Those become the seasons of, of growth, uh, when we have to choose to follow Jesus. Now you might say that this is not very practical, loving everybody as Jesus talks about here. And uh, you're right. It's not. Jesus never actually uses the word practical. The word practical is not in the Bible. I looked. I checked. It's not there. Uh, Jesus is not worried about short-term practicality. What he is talking about, what he is arguing based upon, is that we are citizens in the coming kingdom of God, and we will catch persecutions between now and then. We will catch persecutions, and we hold on to the fact that the greatest persecution, the cross, leads to resurrection. And we hold on to the further fact that the more that people follow Jesus, the more that loving all people and this unlimited love, the more practical it becomes. Right? The more that people practice it, the more that others are able to practice it. Now, Jesus does not describe exactly how this is going to work. He does not lay it out. He does not give us the bullet points of what we are going to do. He makes sure that we know that who our neighbor is. Go read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the Samaritan cares for someone who is of a different race, a different nationality, a different uh, socioeconomic class, and that's his neighbor, right? Your neighbor is everyone you are in contact with. Jesus lays out very clearly, love your neighbor includes everyone, but he doesn't tell us what that looks like looks like. I do think Paul does give us a hand, though. Paul gives us the love chapter. Love, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. You've all heard this at weddings how many times? Uh, love is envious or boastful. Not boastful or rude. Here's what I'd suggest you try. If you're not sure how good you are at loving, take out the word love and put your first name in, there in, in, this, in the place of it and see if you can read it with a straight face. For example, Andy is patient. Andy is kind. Andy is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Andy does not insist on his... Yes, he does insist on his own way. Sorry. Andy is not irritable. Yes, I can be. Or resentful. Andy does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. Andy bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. All right. Read that and see if you can read it with a straight face. And, and if you, the points at which you start to... Uh, that's where we all got a little bit of growing to do. Two last words about this, this section on the Sermon on the Mount. First, I want us to fully remember that uh, Jesus is laying out a goal, and he's not saying you've got to get there tomorrow. For us to be people who, uh, whose word is utterly trustworthy, for us to never look down on another, to be, us to be able to love other people as our Heavenly Father loves them, that is not going to happen today. It's probably not going to happen tomorrow. Next month it's looking iffy as well. This is a goal to strive towards. This is something beautiful to inspire us. This is not a club to beat ourselves up with. There is grace and forgiveness every Sunday that we gather to hear we are forgiven and empowered to go out and try again. This last thing I want to leave you with is to imagine what your life could be like if this was how we lived. Imagine a life where there are no grudges, where anxiety fades, where you don't have to struggle with anger, where you can seek the good of others and not even worry about whether you're getting ahead or, or not, whether you're getting your way or not. Wouldn't that be a better way to live? Go forth this day to seek the good of others, trusting God to act in and through you. Love people. Even when they don't love you, love people. Love them. Stand up for yourselves, but love them as our Heavenly Father loves them. Amen. We now come to this time of confession when we...